Thanks very much. Uh, my sort of day job is as a chief privacy officer for a company that performs relationship analytics. Uh, this gets right into the middle of privacy law all over the world. So I spend a lot of time dealing with this, and in particular dealing with GDPR. And given that it keeps coming up, and it keeps being a bugbear for developers, operations people, security people, I had intended to do a talk on you know, what technologists need to know about GDPR for FOSS Asia this year. And in fact, that's how this talk ends. But I realized while I was putting it together that there's actually a much larger idea here that I thought was worth sharing. What I realized was that software freedom and the GDPR data subject rights are in fact pursuing the same objective. I hope I'll persuade you that it's, it's almost exactly the same objective. It's not just similar. And then I'll talk about what you need to know about GDPR in practical use. So what is the objective? The FSF's essential freedoms and the GDPR's data subject rights seek to put individual human beings in very real control with respect to computers that we own and use, control of the software that's running on those machines, with respect to data that other people or organizations are processing about us, that is any data and to any organizations or people, control of that data and then a particular kind of control. The actual words used also turn out to be rather similar. Uh, the Free Software Foundation unabashedly talks about freedom and software freedom. And they sort of apologize for free software because what they mean is freedom, not free of charge. GDPR talks about fundamental rights and freedoms. That phrase appears more than 30 times in the regulation. GDPR is unequivocally human rights law. We look at it as yet another technical standard to comply with, but it is not. It is very clearly human rights law. And it, once you get your head around that, that changes the way it looks and changes the way you think about it. Um, frequently, I get people sort of saying to me things like, you know, this GDPR is a real pain. There's all this stuff that it gets in the way, and we've got to do these things, and oh my god, it's, it's so inconvenient. And, and I, who sort of works with it all the time, and uses it as a blueprint, have exactly the reverse uh, response to it. And it finally began to occur to me that this is an argument that I have seen before, historically, centuries ago. It's the complaint that a change in social norms and in laws and in the enforcement of those laws gets in the way of an existing set of practices. And so the example I'd give is this one. Before you think I've gone completely off the deep end, the point I'm making in the first instance is just that society progresses. Legal systems change. Businesses that are locked into or dependent upon an old way of doing things will struggle when these transitions occur. Just as cotton pickers in the southern part of the US in particular were really upset about the idea that they would no longer be able to own cotton pickers. They'd have to go and do it themselves. So sorry, the cotton farmers were upset that they would no longer be able to own cotton pickers. However, after I thought about this for a while, I realized that the parallel runs much, much deeper than is readily apparent. Uh, I won't take you through this entire document, but it's fascinating. It's fairly straightforward language. It's only about 30 pages long. The EDPS is a role, the European Data Protection Supervisor is an individual role created within the EU system. I won't try to explain where it sits, because you end up with gigantic, complicated diagrams of EU institutions. The important facts are that this gentleman has remarkable rights with respect to both the legislative and regulatory processes within the EU, and is therefore somewhat influential. It's a five-year uh, contract, basically. Uh, the current gentleman, whose name I neglected to note, uh, is very well-versed, uh, does not mince words, but absolutely understands the, the topic. From this particular opinion, uh, I've extracted two sentences. And I, I wish to emphasize, this is a little part of the problem that he's explaining in that opinion. He deals with the whole range of methods of manipulation. Uh, the whole dark patterns thing, uh, addictive patterns, all those things, but also targeted advertising. 
This is a method of manipulation. Target advertising isn't just like broadcast advertising or newspaper advertising, but a bit better. It's better because it is more able to change the decisions that people make. And the means that are used to produce it and to fine tune it and to fine tune its delivery categorically have nothing to do with the improved accuracy or precision or personal welfare resulting from those decision making processes. They relate exclusively to the increased revenue for the platforms that are using and performing the targeting. Strong words, but he goes further. In fact, he goes much further. I reiterate, this is one little part of the problem. The principle, uh, among, he basically identifies the human rights that are at stake. The principle of electoral transparency is not met if voters cannot seek, receive, and share information about the process and the candidates and their funding. These rights are also, therefore, challenged by online manipulation. A direct consequence of these two observations is that targeted advertising is incompatible with democracy. It's that stark. And this is not hypothetical. We've now seen it with the recent US presidential elections and the Brexit vote. We have very good reason to believe that the Russian troll factory was involved in the 2016 presidential election in the US and increasing evidence that the same is true for Brexit. Targeted advertising is a high power, super precise manipulation machine. It is totally incompatible with the concept of individual citizens governing a, a society or a state. And for the third time, this is only one of the problems. He identifies a dozen other problems at this scale. So, while the abolition of slavery seems like an almost crazy point of comparison, it starts to seem a bit less crazy. The other point I'd make is, it's not remote from us. Maybe all these weird things that lawyers and human rights activists are getting up into is perhaps out of scope for false Asia. This talk happened on Friday. This is a project that's looking to produce a personal assistant that works for its user. It takes away the biases that are there to serve the platform owner and the highest bidding of their customers. They're looking to adopt Susie as a core component of a neutral, unbiased, fair personal assistant. This is Fosasia two days ago. So it's, it's right in the middle of what Fosasia is about. Excuse me. Briefly, all of this was a stalking horse for reminding people that we're about the F as well as the O. Um, we spend a lot of time talking about open source. And I don't object to that at all. It, it's, it's, it's a legitimate mechanism. It's the basis for most of our cooperation. The distinction from free software or with free software is perhaps not immediately obvious. So much so that when we had our first keynote last year from a member of the or representative of the open source initiative, he essentially claimed that free software and open source software were the same thing that there was no difference between them at all. From the standpoint of the approach, that is somewhat true in the sense that all free software is also open source software. And the Free Software Foundation, in fact, supports this view. This is the same approach being pursued in the service of two different objectives. One is user's freedom. The other is quality, efficiency, flexibility of software. Footnote, into predatory uh, vendor lock-in, which is a kind of freedom, uh, what is, in fact, a freedom-related objective. But apart from that overlap, they are two quite different objectives. It happens that the approach to them is very much the same. But today's discussion is more about the two different approaches to, the, to a specific uh, objective, that being the, the free software, rather than the open source objective. So I don't wish to suggest that one is greater or less than the other. They are both important. And the fact that the approaches overlap so enormously means that we're able to deal with or we're able to address both in this forum.
hopefully most people in this room have already seen this, but in case you haven't, the four essential freedoms that the FSF identifies for free software are to run a piece of software, or program is the word they use, for at, at will, any way you like, and for any purpose. To study it and modify it any way you like, for whatever reason you like. To share copies of the program in order to help people around you. And to share copies of the all modified version of the software further to help people around you. This is different to, although related to the the open source definition and therefore the Debian free software guidelines. But for today's talk, I'm talking specifically about the freedoms that free software is, uh, is aimed at. I, I'll ask for a show of hands. Is this familiar to everyone? Or at least some people. About half. All right. Fair enough. OK, so now let's go and have a look at GDPR, and specifically the data subject rights. GDPR is 88 pages, which sounds like a lot until you compare it with things like HIPAA and a bunch of other uh, even more prescriptive rules. A chunk of it is a set of legally enforceable human rights that are created. These are called rights. They apply to every single natural person within the jurisdiction of the EU member states. So this is literally human rights law. Um, the last two there are actually expressed as obligations of controllers rather than rights of individuals. But for the purposes of the discussion, they're relevant. They are, if someone is processing personal data about you, you have a right to have access to that data. You have a right to correct errors in it. If you've got a health records are a common example that have incorrect information about what you're allergic to or your medical history, that may in fact endanger your life. So you have, of course, a right to access that information from anyone who holds it, and if it's incorrect, to correct it. Likewise, things like uh, credit ratings, perhaps a more direct example where the rectification comes in. If there's information about someone else's debt, unpaid, that's damaging your credit reference, then you either can't borrow, or it will be more expensive for you to borrow. You have a right to fix that. You have a right of erasure. In a whole lot of cases, unless there are specific compelling reasons, and I'll get to those, you can simply instruct a controller to delete data about you, and they are legally obliged to do so, and to confirm that they have done so, and to do so within 30 days. Uh, restriction of processing is related. Uh, this came up for the Royal London Free Hospital and Google DeepMind. I would point out that the fault here was the hospitals and not Google's. Um, they went through the entire process to ensure that what they were doing was legitimate with respect to using the machine learning technique for better uh, diagnosis. However, while they're at it, they said, oh yeah, and you can go and do a bunch of test cases completely outside the process, failing to perform the assessment and failing to recognize that doing so would bias the resulting uh, machine learning in ways that were not anticipated within the assessment. The regulator was uh, graceful enough to invite the hospital to sign an enforceable undertaking that ran about 15 pages basically to do a bunch of things they were supposed to have done in the first place and didn't levy a fine, but they published it. And this is a common thing for particularly GDPR regulators. They'd rather change behavior than punish. And if they can do so by saying, here's what's expected, <laughs> here's someone who did it wrong, and here's how we will react nicely if you clean up your act fast, which is say, not levy a 20 million euro fine. Data portability doesn't apply universally, but certainly in cases where you provide the data, the, this is a bit like sort of your money in the bank account, and they'll make a, I'll come back to that analogy. Um, the controller is obliged not only to make the data available to you upon request, but to also facilitate the automated transfer to some other controller, including a competitor. So I think Google Takeout, perhaps, as, a, as an example of a first cut of a mechanism of this kind, but the idea is that the act of engaging a controller to process data for you should not lock you in. It should be possible for you to move, a bit like being able to move phone numbers, being able to uh, keep your phone number when you move between telcos, uh, that you shouldn't be locked in by the fact that it's difficult to shift. There are rights of objection. I won't dig deeply into those, but they're basically, uh, if you're unhappy with something that the controller has done, then to uh, call them out on that and have them formally explain themselves. Uh, and there's an unnamed right to be free from automated decision-making that have major, only those that have major effects. The fact that a ticket barrier won't let you through 
uh, if there's something wrong with your uh, electronic ticket, um, is not something you can then go and sort of file a complaint about, although you, perhaps you can. Rather, things like credit decisions, um, access to welfare, enrollment on electoral ledgers, all those sorts of things, if you are unhappy with an automated decision, you have a legally enforceable right to have the controller have a human being review the decision and document that review and the basis of either retaining the decision or modifying it. And the failure to do so within 30 days is itself an action that's, with it, that's a breach of the regulation and is itself actionable as a breach. The transparency and the integrity of oh, sorry, the transparency is important because if a controller is not transparent about what they're doing, then there's no way for you to exercise these rights. If you don't know that someone's processing data about you, then you can't even start this process. So there's a, there's a mechanism by which you must announce that you are processing data. Generally, it's registration with a uh, regulator. And finally, uh, obligations of integrity and confidentiality. And this is sort of uh, too obvious to say, that's why it doesn't turn up as a right, but if you are entrusting confidential personal information to an organization to process, then they're obliged to keep it confidential. They can't turn around and sell it having told you they were going to do otherwise. So this doesn't look a whole lot like the FSF's essential freedoms. Access is a little bit like access to the code, rectification is a bit like modifying the code to, to fix bugs, but the rest is just clearly unrelated. I noticed one day that uh, there's a different way to think about them. Information security is a function in most organizations that provides to the board and stakeholders a set of capabilities with respect to information possessed by the, system, by the organization and the systems used to process that, that information. Those capabilities are traditionally confidentiality, medical records stay secret, integrity, the errors are corrected or don't exist, and availability. Now, the latter is perhaps less obvious, but if you are unconscious in an emergency room, uh, the, the people attending to you need access to your medical records. It's not okay to say, oh, the computer's down, come back next week. So availability is a somewhat important, although often overlooked, uh, piece of information security. Uh, then there's another, it's named a few different ways, accountability, trustworthiness, and it's sliced different ways depending on whose um, scheme you look at, but uh, the ability to object, to be, to be free from automated decision making and transparency are broadly accountability obligations. So this, on this telling, the data subject rights in GDPR are essentially infosec. But instead of being on behalf of the board and the shareholders and the regulators and society at large, they're on behalf of the individual data subjects about whom personal data is being processed. I don't know if this helps you or not, but it certainly helped. For me, it was a light bulb moment. It suddenly clicked for me that this is literally security as an individual with respect to information being processed about me. And so certainly this shift from data controllers having their information that they possess and do whatever they like with, to data controllers are custodians of information about you that they process under your direction, subject to your consenting or not objecting. That's a shift. Aha. You might be wondering, therefore, okay, so far I understood the thing, but what's the purpose of GDPR? The assumed purpose by people who are objecting is that it's to prevent the flow of information. In fact, it's the reverse. Yes, harmonize the protection of fundamental rights and freedoms and ensure the free flow of personal data. This is a direct quote from recital three on page one. The GDPR's purpose is to ensure the free flow of personal data. So if you're up against something that says, oh my God, the GDPR is stopping me from getting my thing done. Firstly, you've completely misunderstood what it's about. It doesn't say you can't do, it says you can do, and then spells out what you must do in order to comply. And secondly, depending on what you're doing, this might be a big signal that you need to stop doing what you're doing and rethink it. And not because the GDPR thinks you're bad, but because you're doing something that's inappropriate for human beings. So, what do technologists need to know? The most surprising, or one of the three or four, but perhaps the most surprising thing that keeps coming up is what personal data is. There's a term in wide use in the US and a bunch of other jurisdictions, including Australia, personally identifiable information. And it's tied to only the first of these, identifies like names, ID numbers, locations, online identifiers. 
GDPR employs a much broader definition. Anything at all that relates to an identified or even identifiable natural person is personal data. Every single photograph that's being taken during Cross Asia includes enough information to separate the person whose face appears in the photograph from another person, to tell the difference. That's the factor specific to the physical identity of that, that natural person. The fact that we know nothing else about the person, don't know their name, their address, where they live, nonetheless, it's personal data. If you're doing that inside the EU, you are already inside the, the scope of the regulation. And again, th that's not a problem. The regulation is not a list of what you can't do, it's the opposite. It's a list of what you can do. So you want to be inside the scope. But that, that, that just surprises people. Uh, example, the uh, anonymization framework that uh, Felipe presented yesterday, I think, um, with the format preserving pseudonymization of things like phone numbers. So you are replacing a correct phone number with one that is still the right format, but has a you know, lookup key somewhere. So it's a pseudonym. A, it's still personal identifiable because if you have the key, you can map that back to an individual. But B, you might have mapped to the phone number of another natural person. Well, that's an identifier that relates to a person. Even though you only got there coincidentally, you are processing data that relates to that person. You have legally enforceable rights. or well, that person has legally enforceable rights against you, even though you don't know who they are. So it's, it's a very, very, very broad definition. Oh, and the, yeah, the other big one, it's not limited. There's nothing about this that limits it to confidential data. The mere fact that you've been named as having been convicted of murder in a newspaper is not sufficient excuse for a web host or a website search index, Google, for example, to continue processing or even retaining that information. That's the right to erasure, is where this comes from. So the, the things I'm talking about aren't just about secret data, they're about anything at all about a human being. And to back to the EDPS opinion, there's a whole lot of public data that can be used to profile you and more precisely manipulate you. So GDPR scope includes the whole lot. Uh, bit time for time, so very quickly. Territorial scope. Generally, if you are inside the jurisdiction of an EU member state, then all processing of personal data is subject to the regulation. If you are outside, then you come into the regulation scope under two circumstances. One is you're promoting goods and services to people within, even if they're free, but certainly if they're for money. Marketing is the big one, so you're profiling, you're inside. You, you must then comply. The other is if you're doing anything that qualifies as monitoring. This is unfortunate. It's a bit difficult to say what monitoring is and isn't when you actually get down to it, but roughly if you are observing change over time. Uh, lawful basis, I might eat most of my time on this because this is really, really important. Processing is lawful if and only if you fit one of these six buckets. If you don't, you are breaking the law. It's, it's that blunt. There are two scope exceptions, incidentally, uh, p domestic. So friends' phone numbers in your phone, no problem. Judicial, if you work for a court, different set of rules. But everybody else, every for-profit company, every non-profit, every political party, Every government body, every quengo, the whole lot are within the scope of the, the regulation. The six bases. The first one is consent. I'll get to the rules for consent in a moment. They're extraordinarily high. It works for marketing. It's not much good for a great many other things. The tendency to attempt to consent order uh, is understandable and bad. It's not enough to have common law consent. Uh, necessary for performance of a contract if I'm a mere commerce provider and you place an order with me to deliver to your home. Of necessity, I will give your address to a courier. I don't need your consent for that. I'm legally obliged. Um, compliance with legal obligation, mostly for, for, for regulated industries, so bank, KYC stuff, you don't need consent for that. Um, predict, predict vital interests. Someone's going to die, OK. Disclose now, argue later. Public interest or official duty, importantly, Public interest is not DIY. It must be in a way that's spelt out in member state law. This matters to archivists. You can't archive personal data in the EU unless you have member state law setting out what it is. Uh, and finally, legitimate interests. And this is where a whole lot of stuff comes up. That 
as long as what's being pursued, the data is gained legitimately and the interest being pursued is legitimately, then you can process. However, you've got to do the balancing exercise with the data subjects human rights. There's a standard way to do it. It takes a few hours. It's not terribly difficult, but it has to be done. It's got to be documented and it's got to be available to data subjects and to the regulators. Um, purpose specification is critically important. You must know what the purpose is and you must have documented it. Firstly, your, your lawful basis depends upon it. And secondly, all the choices you will make stem from that. This is a, another much longer session, but just understand that it's not just keep that because it might be useful. You must have a purpose, you must state it. Consent limitations are staggering. Um, it's got to, you can't bundle it. The subject can withdraw at any time. You must tell them prior to getting consent that they can withdraw at any time. It shall be as easy to withdraw as to give consent. All of these nag bars that are saying accept cookies, strictly speaking, they must then put up a nag bar that allows you to decline. Because it must be as easy as. If you've made it easy to consent, you must also make it easy to decline. You're, you're making a cross for your own back. If you don't meet all of these, then your consent is invalid for GDPR purposes. It's a very, very, very high bar. And it it's can't be used in relation to dependence. Generally, you can't, an employer can't rely on the consent of an employee. You've got to use legitimate interests and you've got to perform the assessment. I apologize for running over, I'm almost there. Um, there's a bunch of information that has to be provided. This looks a bit like a privacy policy, but you'll start to see in EU websites what are called data protection notices. Sometimes it's on the website, sometimes it's on a form. There's a few different ways to provide it. There are also disclosures relevant during uh, research that involves personal data, even the identified personal data. Um, most importantly, don't panic. It's complicated, it does create a bunch of new obligations, it does interfere with long-established ways of doing business, as did the abolition of slavery two centuries ago. Don't allow this to freak you out, get help, work out what you have to do, and do it. The regulation's purpose is to facilitate the free flow of data.